The Sports Hot Seat is brought to you by SportBuff, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Starter, now offering the most comprehensive 1-900 sports info and update line 24 hours a day. Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat. I'm Mitch Garber with uh, Mitch Melnick, and today, Mitch, two young radio talents who I think are going to go a long way in this business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we welcome back Ted Blackman, who did this show last year. The only show we had to edit, by the way. No, the only show that had an editing mistake in it. Did yeah. I say a bad word? No, 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 no. no, no. It's, no it was just, us. We went long. Oh, we went it's long. the only show in three years. You what did you cut out? Can we play it today? <laughs> <laughs> I will go short. <laughs> <laughs> George Balkan, who's back in this building where he used to work for a few years, right? Yeah. Sure. You? It's nice like being so home. So did I. It's like being, yeah. Well, that's right, of course. Yeah, we're heroes here. Did you work? We like, never worked together here. It's like going back and visiting your own Mexican hotel room, and the maid still hasn't made it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, your production values are much different than uh, yeah, we don't have any to be years any. ago. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, on Channel Nine, it used to be uh, no no viewers and black and white and uh, no graphics or anything. And now, geez, you made me a star the last time I was here. Yeah. The you biggest thing that, that happened to Ted in a long how time. long my name my picture hasn't been in the Gazette, and uh, we work in the audio medium of. Uh, of the uh, radio, and I started to go out after uh, the show was on, and I'd walk in and see people I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis, like the clerk at Cumberland or the guy who pumped the gas at the Sunoco station on Sherbrooke, and, Blackman, <laughs> how do you know? Channel 9. There you know. So Amazing. Yeah, and, I did, and I did that game show, that awful game show. Beat the clock. No. Mad Dash. Oh, you it's don't want to admit that one, it's right? Your it's your move. Oh, it's your move. move. I'm sorry. It's your move, and I want to know when I'm getting my Z-brick. <laughs> Everybody gets paid. <laughs> Who did Every, beat the that clock? or a year's supply of pantyhose, <laughs> was which it, I don't need. Name? Cameron. Uh, Who did beat the clock, George? Who did beat the clock? Yeah. Wasn't the guy's name Cameron? Uh, there were a series of guys. Ward Cornell? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Nars did beat the clock, didn't he? Yeah, they brought an American up. Okay. And it was so, so you, expensive, they decided that eventually they'd get Canadians. But that, was that part of your whole deal when you came to CFCF Radio to do TV as well? It's your move and the, the, the movie no, show? No, originally, originally I came to uh, do uh, a game show and movies. And, that, and I was going to be still working at CJAD. Did you leave him? I mean, how, how were you... Did, was he, were no, you we've his always boss? been together. Who broke up with him? joined yeah. at the hip. <laughs> well, the, the historical parameters. Uh, it's been 25 years now on and off with a couple of delinquencies. <laughs> he left for two years here, I left for two years here, that we've been together. But when I came there, it was largely because of George and the late Doug Williamson, who uh, thought that I uh, had, had turned out wrong, thought I could add something to their morning show. And so George was my, uh, my mentor back then. Yeah, I Do you accept him. that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Mac McCurdy one day, called me in and he said uh, in his little corner office there at the corner of Mountain and St. Catherine, he said, I don't know what we're going to do with this Blackman guy. I'm afraid we're going to have to let him go. And I said, no, you can't. You can't possibly let him go. He's, uh, he's uh, wonderfully well informed about the sports world. <laughs> he owes me too much money. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to keep him working. <laughs> Uh, we had a little thing going with the NFL at the time, and so, <laughs> so that was it. A pool of sorts. And so, uh, and so that's the way he got that morning show. He got that uh, morning so sports and, show. Uh, and about six years later, George leaves to go to, uh, to CFCF Radio, and the best morning man in Montreal, so they name me program director and say, you fight against them. <laughs> it was impossible, so I stole them back. And, that's about uh, it. More or less uh, uh, in title only. Did you miss him? Did you I've miss been each his other? Boss, but we work like uh, you know Joe Montana and the rest of the backfield. Did you miss each other, or was it a good time to have a break from each other at that point? No, it was difficult. It was really difficult because fundamentally we'd worked together so long and we were very good friends, and then suddenly you 
are at each other's throats, business-wise, and it's difficult to remain friends and still have that camaraderie that we talk about in this game. And, uh, and it was really difficult. It was two years of, of real hell because you get to rely and you understand how the other guy works really well, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. the only rationale I ever went on, maybe George agrees with it, too, although he can speak for himself, is I thought by being stiff competitors, but while remaining friends through it all, that we would tend to bring out the best in each other and that the listener would profit because we really had to work hard oh. for each listener we got. Uh, because the other guy was doing something the next day, and if you got him, you knew he'd be back on Thursday with some new yeah. gimmick, and he'd get and you. So, you know, it was I was working at CFCF Radio, and and Ted would be working really hard at CJD, and that's how Shom suddenly rose up. <laughs> <laughs> you that's, split the vote. <laughs> yes. War of attrition. What did you, What did you learn from? I mean, you worked with these guys for how long? One or the other, or both? For how many years? Uh, Eighty-two at CJD till ninety. Until 92, so 92, 10 years. 11 years. The most important. Years? Yeah. Well, the thing that amazed me about George the first time I, I worked with him to fill in, when I used to fill in for Ted, was how well prepared. You said on a previous show, two hours on the air is not a tough job. <laughs> I know it was, you were being facetious, but how, I mean, he's got jokes indexed how often he's used them in 30 years and when the next appropriate <laughs> time to use them is. I mean, it's just, it's obvious, and it shows on the air, and he reads everything, and, and that shows too. I mean, you've got to be, you got to do your homework. You don't do your homework, it shows. And that's one of the reasons for the success of, of their show and the, and the radio station there. George will teach you a lot about uh, preparation for a show. He'll teach you a lot about how you continually have to go out there and, 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 and work for the benefit of the community and those in it. He'll show you how to uh, keep your cool and remain professional under the most trying of circumstances. And he'll also lead you to the edge of the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> Push the, the frontiers. <laughs> of early morning, early morning radio <laughs> to the acceptable <laughs> limits of today. Yeah. Which are what? How far have you pushed it? Did you ever, ever go over the edge? Oh yeah, I think we've gone over the edge. Um, well, we certainly have changed. I mean, in the years that we've worked together, uh, 10 years ago, you could not possibly do today's radio because A, the vocabulary isn't the same. 10 years ago, you could not use the words you use today on radio because communication is different. I mean, it's, it's Letterman and it's a whole bunch of other things, but people talk differently today than they did 10 years ago. When I started out in radio, you could not say a woman was pregnant. You could say that she was with child, but you couldn't even use the word pregnant. Now, knocked up is acceptable, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, it changes, it really does. Well, you look at the uh, primetime fair on television today and remember that Mary Tyler Moore wasn't allowed to, had to sleep in a twin bed, right? Yeah. Yeah, on the Mary Tyler Moore show, and that's not that long ago. Yeah, and it was still great uh, television. You guys are both fairly shy, from my experience, when you're not on here or not on the radio. And I don't know if that's a common theme with a lot of radio people, but I think in general the people who listen to you probably think that you are, you know, very extroverted, and probably yourself uh, yourself as well. You want to tackle that first? <laughs> don't forget, we work on a stage that is six by six and there's no one else there and there's no live audience, perhaps we are shy and that's why by being alone uh, we can't entertain an audience we can't see and doesn't terrify us. And fundamentally to also on, on doing a morning radio program, you're talking with one person, you know, or maybe two at the outside. As we talk about old time radio, it, that was when Fibber McGee and Molly were on and dad used to say, come on mom, come over to the radio and listen to Fibber McGee and Molly. You don't have families going and listening to a morning radio program, very seldom anyway. You're lucky if you can get more than two members of the same family at the breakfast table together, let alone agreeing on what radio program to listen to. You know, so you're dealing with one person. That's why we're, we aren't really withdrawn, but we are more one-on-one -on -one people, I think. Well, I think the common thread is, I think a lot, most radio people is, you're not on once you're off. I mean, you, I, I think it would be difficult to live with or hang around with somebody in radio who's always on, even when they turn the microphone off, they're mm -hmm. still on. I think that's tough to take. Oh. Well, you know, but the, que the question is, how do you think your show would change if you did your show surrounded by 98,000 people live at one time? I'd be intimidated because I'd get off a one-liner and 
80 out of 100 people might laugh and 20 <laughs> might boo and hiss. And all I'd hear were the hisses. He's very... I can't tell what they're doing when it's radio, you know. I, it's perfect by me. <laughs> He's very, very sensitive. He cannot take rejection. And that's, the, that's one of the things about his life. No, we do a thing called uh, Tickle Pink Breakfast as part of the Just for Last Festival. And we go out and we actually have breakfast with a couple of hundred people. And uh, to answer your question, it's alive and well and we have some of the top comedians that come in from the Just for Last Festival. And we have a good time. I think it sparks the show. I love doing the show out there. Uh, but I tell you, it's underarm time. Uh, when it's live and you've got 200 people or 300 people out there, uh, you sweat a lot. You really do because you work twice as hard. Oh, more than that. But you also can understand the attraction of people who do enjoy performing in front of a live audience. The immediacy oh, yeah. and uh, the adrenaline rush when you know it's going okay. Well, you, Mitch, don't, you, feel you should it, ask right? Blackman, who does much more speaking than I do, and I haven't done any for a long while, but there is no greater thrill than going out and speaking to a group of people and finding the reaction alive coming back at you, the, the laughter, the, the reaction to what you're doing, the acceptance. There's also nothing like the rejection that I was talking no about. No more lonely <laughs> feeling than that. <laughs> you know, if you do it wrong, you really do it wrong. But when it's right, it's just fantastic. Yeah, when you bring the speech for a sports stag dinner to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the women of Hadassah and their annual <laughs> luncheon, you have the wrong, wrong file. In deep <laughs> trouble. Uh, but we, we always carry spare scripts now in the glove compartment, so that doesn't happen. I can race down to the parking lot and save myself every time. <laughs> But well, it's always good to poke fun at yourself, right? Yes, I, uh, that's the only time. I only enjoy it in the limelight when uh, I'm having a good time with, uh, like, George working together. It's a good uh, working existence. Or speaking where I'm in control of my script and can and make people laugh. I enjoyed that. I was class clown when I was a, a kid. But I've been taught uh, since the basics of journalism, you're not the story. And too many people forget that too often. You are not the story. The Montreal Canadiens are the story this week. Uh, Réjean Tremblay is not the story. Uh, well, he made himself the story. I know, he makes himself the story. Well, if you call that shyness, then I'm shy. I'd rather not be the story. One of the most embarrassing moments of my life was when Maury Wills took a slap at me. Uh, uh, I've told the story many times. I've laughed at it in a self-deprecating way. Uh, tell the Maury Will story again. I don't want to. I mean, I didn't want to be on the sports pages of any newspaper involved with it. I just wanted to cover it. Uh, I think too many people forget and think they are the story these days and uh, never get to the meat of what's available to them in the butcher shop. By the way, Mitch, this is uh, seat uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Seven, eight, nine. Well, I'm six. Right. Are you All right. oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Seven, five, five, and five. And five. I'm sorry. All right. Let me keep my seat for now. For now. For now. Even yeah. Even if it's only uh, hypothetical. So you're a baseball fan. Yep. yep. You you're are you a hockey fan too? Yeah. Uh, you hang around him for uh, like decades. Yeah. You can't be anything. You have to be a hockey. You have to be a sports fan in this town, to some degree anyway. Um, I watched a, a show. One of your shows where you asked whether it was absolutely necessary for a morning broadcaster to be a sports fan. And yes, the answer is yes. You have to be somewhat of a sports fan, if not a real, true, dyed-in-the-wool sports fan. I love baseball. Uh, do you want to go any further than that? <laughs> <laughs> We've been, uh, Ted and I have been season ticket holders for in excess of 10 years. Yeah, George likes baseball. He'd have to tell you why. I mean, I like all sports. George seems to have a press uh, preference for baseball as a spectator, live spectator. Would mm -hmm. that be correct to say? Yeah. And perhaps be, be and George is also uh, a fine artist, and he is terrific at capturing uh, the human figure, especially when it's in emotion or exertion. And uh, I think you, uh, that's why baseball is so akin uh, to your taste, is that you, that's what you see. You see tremendous motion, you tr see tremendous athleticism, and it's, uh, it, it reminds me a lot of your paintings. Exactly what I would have said. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. You want me to, no, want me no, to no, run no, your next no, no, tour? No, no <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> you know, p people have described baseball as the reason it's so popular in the Orient is because it's an art form. And the movement, everything, every bit of it is, uh, is, is a type of art. And I love 
the the slow motion of baseball. I really, do. I don't wait for the for the home run or anything else. I just love the motion of the people on the thing. It's a great, great sport. Wonderful to watch. Do you have a Balkan original? Yes, a couple. And prominent, prominently displayed. Oh, certainly. Uh, right next to right his, next when to he the comes towels. over, right, right. right next to right the, next the towels. Right next to the TV. I have, I have, a, I have a beautiful painting of a uh, of a woman that George did lifting a sack of grain on a street corner in what? In Haiti. In Haiti, and uh, people who know anything about painting at all and, and know much more than me will stop in front of that painting and they'll look at it and they'll just be mesmerized by it. And one of the things they point out is how. They don't even notice it's a George Balkan signature. That painting, they go, jeez, uh, how did that artist get that moment of exertion as that woman is just about to pick up that heavy load? And I say, because he's gifted. It's a George Balkan. He knows what he's doing when he does that. It's not just your hobby. Art's not just a hobby. No, no, no. Never was. Uh, I, was a, I was a sports cartoonist. I was an editorial cartoonist uh, for many years. Uh, I had uh, two agents, one in New York and one in St. Louis. The one in New York sold cartoons to, uh, to ma major magazines, and the other guy so in St. Louis sold it to industrial magazines. I, you couldn't see very much of my work because I don't know whether you ever subscribe to uh, sluts uh, <laughs> uh, and other major male magazines. Uh, but uh, I did that for about five years. But he uh, has used the washrooms yeah. at the old Sir Winston Church of Pablo. Oh, then you may have seen some of my <laughs> cartoons. And, and, I have subscribed, and I have subscribed to sluts. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a way of making a living, and I, it, I didn't make a living out of it. It added to what I did in radio. And... Uh, it was, it was fun. I how did long, sports cartoons, though, for the Hamilton Spectator for a little while. For how long years. do you spend? Do you spend every day, virtually every day, in your studio? You mean p painting and... Yeah, in your thing? studio. Yeah, well, I have a place down in St. Lawrence. I like the area. Uh, and uh, I go there and probably work seven or eight hours a day there, painting or getting ready for the next day's program. And he watches O.J. Or these days. <laughs> or whatever. Or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. You know. Before OJ, it was uh, the Menendez. Uh, yeah, Menendez. Yeah, I got hooked on Court TV. It's terrible. Did you get, did you get Heidi Fleiss too, or uh, I didn't it was watch. Too short. I didn't watch that or Bob it. No, I picked my cases. I. <laughs> I think like <laughs> <the> only, <laughs> hey, I don't watch anything. And the only reasons I do is if I had stayed in school, I, I would have had an ambition to become a lawyer, a trial lawyer, and a defense a trial lawyer. Uh, from the age of fourteen, fifteen, I read everything I could on. Uh, on famous uh, cases, uh, I was a big fan of anything Clarence Darrow had ever handled. For I the read, defense, great book. Uh, all, all those books. I, read, I owned about five books on the Leopold and Loeb case alone. I, I felt I was there in 19, uh, you know, uh, 12. That's a great it, case to bring up, the Leopold and Loeb case. A case I was where two guys tried to, tried to pull off the perfect crime. Actually, that's why I've been in court so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I find my safe self uh, ways to get in trouble <laughs> with the authorities so that I can be in court and witness the trial. Do you have an OJ prediction? Uh, I mean, we'll keep this tape and, you know, one no, day... Uh, that's La La Land out there, you know. Uh, I mean, that's a town where anything can happen. Uh, you know, Dave Van Horn and I first visited L.A. in 1969 together, and we had a rented car, a convertible, from a Hertz people, and we left Dodger Stadium after the end of the ball game, and we were driving down Sunset Strip, which means you're driving at about one quarter mile per hour, and this whole world zoo was out there on the sidewalks, and you're edging your car ahead slowly and slowly, and looking around at things, and this guy carrying pizzas, not in a cardboard box, two of them from one place across the street to a bar, was walking in front of the car when I was turned looking at Dave, and we just touched the crease of his pants, and he turned around, went berserk, hit <laughs> through both pizzas <laughs> on the windshield, <laughs> And I made the mistake of turning the car washer on, which only cooled off the uh, cheese, and now it all <laughs> smeared there. And you couldn't see anything. It was pepperoni hanging out of Dave's hair, and we he had hair. As it, as it he then had hair was, at the time. <laughs> he, had, he had hair back then. He hadn't seen Carl Keel yet. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> we hadn't run up 120 losses. Dave had hair, and we abandoned the car. We called Hertz and said, we got a hit by a pizza on Sunset Strip. The guy said, fine, happens every day. 
<laughs> so that's that's where this trial is being held. I watch it to see the Johnny Cochran's and the Marsha Clark's and the superstars go at each other. Who's your favorite dream teamer? I like Marsha. Oh yeah. Yeah, she's under the most pressure there. The other guys have made all the reps. She is good. There's no she is there's good. little doubt. She yeah. is good. Did you guys live together? Yeah, occasionally off and on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We did no spring training. We did spring training <laughs> together for uh, for a couple of years. Uh, we, we, when the Expos used to go to Daytona Beach, which was just a terrible, terrible place. I mean, nobody enjoyed it. It was awful. We always went down there, and it was right after Speed Week. Oh, yeah. And uh, there were a lot of guys in leather jackets there. <laughs> uh, with, the, with every motorcycle with the thing guy. flashbacks here right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> like this show threw up or something. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was, uh, that was a tough time. Uh, but we've had some great times together. We go to rock and roll shows together. We uh, we heard Gord Lightfoot swear in Daytona Beach. Yes, he was doing one of his most wonderful ballads. He was doing a song called "Beautiful." I don't know whether you're familiar with the song. It's a gorgeous song, and he was standing in, on the stage all alone with his guitar, singing this song in the uh, in the Civic Arena in that city, and a fellow rang out, shouted out from the from the upper balcony, sing, they named another song. Edmund Fitzgerald or something. <laughs> the sinking of. Yeah. And Gord Lightfoot sang the next three words and then stopped. And in two words, famous Anglo-Saxon words, <laughs> told the guy exactly what to Meaning do. Meaning leave this place <laughs> yes. and go to some other place. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then went right back to beautiful. Right back to the song. <laughs> he, didn't miss, he didn't miss a word. <laughs> was, we saw that. Duh. Gord Lightfoot at his best. They were fun times broadcasting from down there. That the, was a different era, though, when we were first started going down there from mm -hmm. almost day one, eh, George? Right. I mean, we'd, we'd have Rusty Staub and all the rest of them back in that era. And the ball players were making the same kind of dough we were making. So it was nothing to say to one of the, uh, any one of the starting players. Can you give us five minutes? We're broadcasting live back to Montreal in the dugout here. They'd, drop, they'd walk out of the cage, and you know how the guys love their swings, eh? and come over and be interviewed. Today, you'd have to negotiate from a week in advance. Talk to with my the agent. agent. Yeah, talk to with my the agent. agent. Yeah. Some guys Dyk 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 how much? Dykstra, how much? Uh, Is that how much? Jack Those we do were it? the two words that yeah, were no. not. <laughs> <laughs> how often did you guys really get stupid, crazy? Not enough. They're still here? We're still got jobs. <laughs> yeah. That's surprising. I've never thought of the question. So I've never really you don't to think about the answer. Uh, well, we get giggly now and then and go over the line a bit, but they accept it. And we get rebuffed uh, now and then when you're in ad lib radio. And you know, Mitch, from working at AD, we're always working in an ad lib form, and you don't know what you're going to say next. And you just, you've got to hope the brain's always engaged with the mouth, and sometimes it isn't. And one time, George just threw me a, a, a question about, uh, oh, by the way, Ted, Expo 67, did you go down there and see the, uh, the Chinese uh, acrobat? Oh yeah, I, the exhibition. They were on cultural they were, tour. It was part of the cultural part of the of the expo, and uh, I said, "Did you go and see the the Chinese dancers, the Chinese acrobats?" And he said, "Where?" And I said, "Place des Arts. They were here last night." And he said, "Why would I go and see them?" I said, "Because they're wonderful athletes. I see they're finely tuned, trained. I said they dedicate their life to this." He said, "Who are they?" I said, "The Chinese acrobats." He says, how much was the ticket? I said, it's thirty-two fifty. He says, I hope that they would do my laundry as well. Oh. <laughs> that that included the laundry. <laughs> no. Oh, see, he just left out. Yeah, I don't know. He <laughs> disparaged the, uh, the whole uh, Chinese, community. Chinese community with that kind of a stereotype. You could do that if you were Chinese. That's yeah. right. I realized that right at that. Uh, you can only make fun of another race, religion, creed, or whatever, if you're a part of that group, it's the not if you're outside. It's the same way that it's easy for a Catholic to make a joke about mea culpa, mea culpa, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, <laughs> <laughs> mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, and it's very easy for a Jewish broadcaster to, to use all of this, the words, or most of the words anyway. To be like or, Jackie Mason. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Jackie Mason, if he was not Jewish, could never do that whole thing. Right. He couldn't use that shtick. You know, you have to you have to be careful. Yeah, we so talked what about happens, that. What happens when he when he does 
occasionally do that. And, it and does, does, does a straight man laugh? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well, like, for example, I, 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 I thought of a one-liner this morning, and I, and I thought about it carefully, and I went ahead and used it, and I hope I was correct. Because, uh, I must have been correct. It couldn't be that offensive. But anyway, I took the chance. You know Trevor Burbick. Boxer? He, yeah, he's now called Israel T. Burbick, the, bar, the boxer formerly known as Trevor. And he got beaten last night. He was just out of shape and lousy at 40 years old. And I said, as a result of the fight, uh, Yitzhak Rabin has turned down his generous offer to allow him to rename his country Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I hope that didn't offend. No, I can't and, say Okay, that. but, uh, you know, you take But you wouldn't be surprised. Well, you else. wouldn't be surprised. You wouldn't be surprised. It will offend somebody. Oh, someone will well, pick up the phone Somebody who needs who needs a sense of humor yeah. adjustment. And, yeah, yeah. Or not even just offend somebody, and you but that's, you're prepared to offend somebody. You're just not prepared to offend many somebodies. And no, then we're you, not in you know, the business well, of offending a people. No, not? but you offend somebody. Oh, Sometimes yeah. you have to. You know, you say something, yeah. and, and and you offend somebody. You can't but, be. Say it's re it's re sort of required to be politically correct today. However, if you were politically correct all the time, you would be unemployed. And very boring. Because, yes. I got, it just I've, work. I've got statistical proof, and I've had it for a number of years, Lost that, 20, <laughs> that 20 to 30 percent of English Montrealers do not think George Balkan is the best morning man in radio. I got proof of that. Yeah. I also got proof that 70 to 75 percent have agreed for 25 years that he is. And I think you've done well by that. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> Now, what about off the air? What about oh, getting off the crazy, air? crazy and stupid through the years? Well, we were younger then; we could do it. We could have and long, longer. We could have long lunches at Swinney's. We did go out for breakfast now and then <laughs> at nine o'clock in the morning at a tavern. What was the name of the tavern? The Devon. It used to, be, yeah, the Devon the tavern yeah. is where Le Chateau is now. One yeah, morning we were too hungover from yesterday's lunch, so I had to go down to the Devon when it opened at eight o'clock and bring a tray of candles back <laughs> for the boys. Across the street. Across the street, only to uh, get in the elevator and have the next passenger get on, Mac McCurdy. The station, station manager. manager. Now we're back where we started. Who wanted to fire you? <laughs> yes, that probably <laughs> was one of the reasons. <laughs> and with 45 seconds left, we have to wonder whether we let Ted get into another story, have the same thing happen no, no, as no. happened the last time he was here, which is tell oh, and he had to stop nine it? tens. No, he didn't stop. We just, we just went long. We had to. Cut yeah, I think. Yeah, we, oh. so we got we, 30 seconds here. Thanks an awful lot. Oh, it's DJ, a pleasure. DJ Morning Show. It's a pleasure. Thank 25 you. years and probably as long as you guys want to keep doing it, right? Uh, Hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I, the friendship has been uh, really more valuable to me than the uh, the working relationship, but both of them. And cut. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a nicer guy in radio than this guy, I want to meet him. Thanks for coming. Thank we'll see you. you next time on the Sports Hot Seat.